Der nächste Vortrag ist von Stefan Seifert. Er hat sich ja fast schon selbst kurz vorgestellt, wo er her ist. Und sein Talk ist jetzt in Englisch und deswegen lese ich auch seine englische Vorstellung vor. Stefan Seifert has been a Perl developer for 17 years, more than half of which he has been fascinated by Perl 6. He is a regular on the Perl 6 IAC channel. Keine Ahnung, wie man das Englisch spricht. And is happy to have found several areas where he could contribute. Okay. You can start. Thank you. We did it. We took 15 years, longer than anyone ever before, to undisputably prove that the student syndrome is unavoidable. 15 years of time to complete the project. And still, when the self-picked deadline arrived, we had to rush to get the final pieces into place. <laughs> One of these pieces was a completely redesigned framework for module installation and loading. Unfortunately, it was also one of the biggest uh, sources of pain right after the release. So how comes? Why did it take 15 years to design this framework? And shouldn't it be a rather mundane part compared to the rest of Perl 6 with threading and everything? Before I answer those questions, let's have a quick look at how other languages like Python and Perl 5 handle module installation and loading. In those languages, modules, module names have a one-on-one -on -one relation with file system paths. We simply replace the double colons by slashes and add a dot .pm and end up with a relative path. Um, both Perl 5 and Python use uh, lists of include paths to complete these paths and have absolute file names that you can load. In Perl 5, those are available in the uh, at ink array. So if the shoe fits, the file is loaded. Job done. Of course, this is a bit of a simplification. Both Perl 5 and Python support pre-compiling modules. Um, in Perl 5, these are the uh, PMC files, and in Python, the PyC files. While the support is there, to my knowledge, almost no one uses this possibility in Perl 5. While in Python, it's quite uh, common for a module to uh, install pre-compiled versions on installation. Module installation in both cases is really just copying files from one place to another. So this system is easy to explain, It's simple, it's easy to understand, and it's robust. In other words, it's pretty much perfect. So Perl 6 should probably just do the same and follow these well-established ex uh, examples. Now, shouldn't it? Well, I would say yes, if it weren't for some features that they lack and that we really want to provide. And those features are Unicode module names, modules published under the same name but by different authors, and having multiple versions of modules installed at the same time. Now, why would you want this madness? Well, the only language that restricts itself to the 26 Latin characters is Latin. Even English has diacritics for many loan words, at least if you write them correctly. Um, they're, they're sharing module names between authors. Um, this may or may not uh, work out well in practice. I can imagine using it, for example, for publishing a module with a fix until the original author includes a similar fix in the official version. And then there's multiple versions. You see, usually people who need this uh, use tools like local lib or containers or homegrown workarounds all of which has some disadvantages, and none of which would be necessary if you could just say, I need vo uh, version 2.9 of this module, or maybe a bug fix release of that. If you had any hopes of continuing using a simple name to file name 
mapping solution, it, you would probably stop at the versioning thing. Because how could you find a version 3.2 of a module when you're looking for a 2.9 or higher? Popular ideas uh, included storing and collecting metadata and um, pushing them in huge JSON files and loading them and looking through them when uh, looking for a module. And when those turned out to be toenail growing slow, the idea was to push the metadata into SQLite databases. However, those ideas can be shut down easily by introducing another requirement, and that is creating packages for Linux distributions. Packages for Linux distributions really are just archives containing some files plus some metadata. Ideally, the process of installing such a package is just extracting the files into a well-known location on the file system and updating the central database. Uninstallation is just the same in reverse. Changing existing files on installation makes packages' lives complicated, and we really want to avoid that. In addition, the names of the to install files have to be known beforehand at the time of packaging, and they may not in any way depend on what is already installed on the target system. So what does the current attempt at solving all these problems look like? Step zero is introducing some definitions. A full module name in Prol 6, a so-called long name, consists of the short name, an auth, version, and API, and actually additional a language. On the other side, the thing you install is usually not just a module, it's a distribution containing one or more modules. And distribution names work just the same. And usually distributions will be called after the main module contained in the distribution. An important property of such distributions is that they are supposed to be immutable. This name will um, always name exactly the same code. In Pro 5 and Python, you deal with include paths, pointing to file system directories. In Pro 6, we call such directories repositories. And each of these repositories is governed by an object that does the component repository role. Instead of an ink array, we have the repo variable. This variable contains a single repository object. This object then again has a next repo property where you can store another repository. In other words, repositories are managed as a linked list, not as an array. The important difference is that this way, each repository has a say in whether to continue looking with the following repositories or not. Perl 6 sets up a standard set of repositories, the Perl, vendor, and site repositories, just like you know them from Perl 5. In addition, it gives you automatically a home repository for the current user. Repositories must implement the need method. A use or require statement in your Perl 6 code is really just compiled to a call to the need method for the repository contained in the dollar star repo variable. This method then may in turn delegate to other repositories. Rakuto comes with several classes that can be used for repositories. The most important ones are CompUnit repository file system and CompUnit repository installation. The file system repo is really meant to be used for developing modules. It actually works pretty much exactly like Perl 5. It does the same simple file name to uh, module name mapping, and it doesn't support versions or auths or any of that. The installation repository is where the real smarts are. When requesting a module, we'll usually do this either via an exact long name or you say something along the lines of, give me a module that kind of matches this filter. Such a filter is given by way of a CompUnit dependency specification object, which has fields for the short name, obviously, 
an auth matcher, version matcher, and API matcher. When looking through the list of candidates, the installation repository will smart match a module's long name against this dependency specification, or to be precise, the individual fields against each other. Thus, a matcher may be some concrete value, or a version range, or even a regex. As previously mentioned, loading the metadata of all installed modules when looking for a candidate would be prohibitively slow. Instead, we use the file system as a kind of a database. We store not only a distribution's files, but also indexes for speeding up lookups. One of these indexes may come um, in the form of directories, named after the short name of the modules. They are stored in the short directory. Um, this is where the by now infamous SHA-1 hashes come into play. Um, the directory names are the ASCII encoded SHA-1 hashes of the UTF-8 encoded module names. Um, these files again contain the ID of the distribution that contains a module with such a short name and the distribution's version and auth and API information. So by reading these files, you, we usually have a rather short list of auth version API triplets that we can use when looking for a candidate. We end up with the winning distribution's ID, which we can then use to load the uh, corresponding dist file, which contains uh, the JSON encoded metadata. And this metadata, again, contains the list of the source files contained in the distribution, which we can then use to look up the uh, module file that we are actually trying to load. Now, like I said, we try to support Unicode, and just uh, storing the file names as is would bring a world of pain on us. And we still have to deal with um, uh, file names that are the same in different distributions. Easiest use case is different versions of the same distribution. They usually contain the same file names. So we cannot just use these file names as is, and instead, again, use SHA-1 hashes of the complete long name plus the local file name. So, It's not only source files that can be found this way. Distributions may also contain arbitrary resource files. These could be, I don't know, images, icons, uh, language definition files, or shared libraries that are compiled on installation. They can be accessed from within the module, from within your source code, using the resources hash. So you don't have to crawl through and include path directory lists to find your, the files corresponding to your distribution. You get the, the paths directly. And as long as you stick to this kind of standard layout of distributions, this even works before installing um, the distribution, while you're still using the file system repository. A nice result of uh, this whole architecture is that it's fairly easy to create special purpose repositories. A first example is CompUnit repository dependency tracker, which you just put into your repository chain and which, which simply records what's going on. And on program exit, tells you which modules were loaded. There are several Perl 5 modules that um, try to do this, but as far as I could find out, none of them can actually tell you what was requested, but only what was loaded. Uh, while in Perl 5 this is not a big distinction, uh, like I said, in Perl 6 it, it can be huge, since you have regexes and version ranges and all of this. The second example is CompUnit repository Panda. It's, you just load this module and it will transparently install all the modules you don't have already on your system and that you uh, load. It doesn't do any harm if those modules are already there because it sits at the end of the repository chain, which is only reached if none of the other repositories actually has this module. And 
something like this is actually quite possible in Perl 5, but it's uh, not nearly as nice source code wise, and it does have a uh, runtime uh, cost. So far, we've looked only at loading modules from source files. However, just the same as Perl 5 and Python, Perl 6 supports pre-compiling modules. And indeed, while in Perl 5 this is a nice bonus, in Perl 6 it's almost essential. Except if you really are content with waiting for a minute or two just to load a moderately sized code base. Yes, compilation in Perl 6 is slow. It takes like forever. Luckily, pre-compilation works at least quite well in most cases. Yet it comes with its own set of challenges. Loading a single module is easy. Fun starts when this module has dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies of their own. When loading a pre-compiled file in Perl 6, we need to load the pre-compiled files of all those dependencies too. And those dependencies must be pre-compiled. We cannot use the source versions there. And even worse, the pre-comp files we load must be the exact same pre-comp files we use during compilation. And to top it off, those pre-comp files work only with the exact same Perl 6 binary that was used for compilation. And all of this would still be quite manageable if it weren't for an additional requirement. As a user, you expect a new version of a module that you just installed to be actually used, don't you? In other words, if you upgrade a dependency of a pre-compiled file, we need to detect this and uh, pre-compile the module again against the new version of this dependency. Now remember that while we have a standard repository chain, the user may prepend additional repositories um, to the head of the chain by the way of the dash i command line option or a use lib in the source code. These repositories may contain newer version of dependencies of pre-compiled modules. Our first solution to this riddle was uh, to give each repository a pre-compilation store where the pre comp files are stored. We only ever load pre comp files from the store of the repository at the head of the chain. If this is, uh, repository is a file system repository, as you would use during um, development with uselib, then we create a precomp store in the dot precomp directory. This is why we scatter all those directories throughout the file system when you just yeah, use Perl 6 and develop. While this is the safe option, this has consequences that uh, whenever you use a new repository, uh, we don't have access to any pre-compiled files. So we have to pre-compile everything you use, again, just because you changed uh, to a different repository. Since the home repository is not available when we install modules system-wide, this also means that uh, though you have to wait for pre-compilation during installing a module, those pre-comp files will not actually be used during runtime. So you have to wait again for pre-compilation. Luckily, a solution for that is uh, pretty much just around the corner. It would maybe even have landed if it uh, weren't for me taking time to prepare talks like this. But uh, I'm quite confident that it will land in the next few weeks. So to draw a conclusion, Perl 6 tries to go a step or five further than other languages. In the case of module management, we shipped a sort of working first implementation. There are lots of opportunities for improvement, um, and especially for improving the user experience. Lots of improvements already in the works and a couple of interesting new possibilities for you as a user. So stay tuned and talk to us on the Perl 6 IC channel with uh, what's bothering you and what you think can be improved. Um, and finally, a little homework exercise for you. Write a comp unit repository that hides an already installed module. Because that would be really useful uh, for writing tests that test uh, that your code works correctly if an optional dependency is not installed. 
with that, um, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions? Um, it wasn't so much a question as a kind of warning statement. I don't think you... Uh, the Perl 5 support for pre-compilation is the absolute minimum hack you might need. All it does is look in the same directory for a file named .pmc, where it was previously looking for a .pm, and run that through the regular parser loader. Um, the way the bytecode system worked was had a first line which was used bytecode that installed a source filter which said, well, the rest of this is bytecode. Mm. And yeah, this works, but it pushes back the whole problem of dependency resolution and a whole bunch of other things into, well, whatever that, whatever the the, um, the byte compiler and the bytecode loader would need to deal with it, and they didn't really. Um, I know the backstory Jonathan's told me about the interaction of begin blocks, so it doesn't do any of the things you really need to do. Um, it's so don't hack. use it. So basically, it doesn't gain you much. <laughs> Please don't use it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that wasn't a question. That was an observation of it's a lot less powerful than your slides implied it might be, and it's certainly not what Python's is, which is real bytecode, as I understand mm. it. Uh, thank you. Wolfgang, here. Yeah. So is the ink hash totally gone, or is there a replacement? The ink hash, um, it's replaced by a sort of more elaborate API. You can ask uh, repositories what module they loaded. That's the module, ma uh, the loaded method. Other questions? Uh, are you, uh, will you be working on stuff like this uh, at the hackathon on Saturday? Oh, yes, very much so. Okay, so if anybody is interested, they, they can come to the hackathon. All right, cool. Yep. Okay, then just enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>